scripture reading. She's going to begin the fifth chapter of Matthew, and it's going to talk about the crowds coming and Jesus going up the mountain. I thought it might be good if we read the last verse of chapter 4, just so we can see who is making up this crowd that is following Jesus. It says, So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted, those with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, oh, you all are good, (laughs) paralytics, and he cured them, and great crowds followed him. So these are the crowds that we're talking about. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And our reading is from Matthew 5, 1 through 16. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for their kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, How can saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The word of the Lord. So last week we had the story of the temptation of Jesus. And we saw how God used that temptation. Some translations use testing instead of temptation. But we saw how God used that time to strengthen Jesus for his ministry ahead. Truly knowing that he was the Son of God meant that Jesus would need to trust God. And it meant that Jesus would need to choose challenge over comfort. We can look at the life of Jesus as we remember that we too are children of God. We too can trust God and walk by faith and not by sight. We can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We can put on the mind of God. Of Christ. And instead of being conformed to the ways of the world, we can, by God's Spirit, be transformed. It's not easy. It does require 
as Rich said last week with the children, for us to make choices. So Jesus left the wilderness, called his first disciples to follow him, saying that he would make them fishers of men. And with today's passage, we have the first of five discourses in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus is teaching his followers. This one's called the Sermon on the Mount because he went up the mountain and sat down. Jesus is going to begin to teach his followers what it means to be his followers, what it means to trust in God and live according to the kingdom of heaven. And it seems the religious leaders who are all about studying the law and following the letter of the law and making new laws to help you follow the law are not getting it. And if the religious leaders aren't getting it, how is your ordinary person to have a chance? To this Jesus says, follow me. Live as I live. Love as I love. And Jesus lifts up several qualities that would be looked down upon, both in his day and in ours. People who are meek, people who mourn, people who are hungry and thirst, people who are hopeless, humble people, people who show mercy, people who are harassed for following Jesus. Jesus says they are already blessed by God. These are the people that are living under the reign of God in the kingdom of heaven. The world, Jesus says, has it wrong. And after today's passage, if you finish out the fifth chapter, you see Jesus taking several of the laws and turning them upside down. Or so it seems he's turning them upside down. He's turning them right side up. He says, you have heard it said, blah, 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 blah. But I say to you, you have heard it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Love those who harass you. Pray for those who persecute you. Hard stuff. Yes? People who follow Jesus and live this way, Jesus says, are the salt of the earth. They don't conform to the world or the status quo. They have a gentle edge about them and live transformed kingdom of heaven lives. They are the light of the world and they shine out the true way to live and love. So Jesus turns things upside down or right side up. And just when it seems that Jesus is throwing out the law, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now remember we talked last week about the kingdom of 
heaven being available here and now. So we're not just talking about entering heaven in the great by and by. But we're to be the salt and the light now. The Pharisees, though, had a point. It would be so much easier if it was all black and white. Do this, don't do that. Right? If you did something good, like give someone who's thirsty a cup of cold water, it wouldn't matter what you were thinking in your heart. It wouldn't matter that you couldn't stand them. You were following the law, right? That's not kingdom living, and it's really not living at all. Seems Jesus is more about gray, more about a deeper interpretation and a deeper living. His fulfilling of the law is about love. His fulfilling of the prophets is about suffering. Do you know a lot about the prophets? They struggled and they suffered. Take Jeremiah, for example. He was thrown down a deep well because the king didn't like what he was saying. They were trying to shut him up. Those who were in power. Jesus came to fulfill their message and he was nailed to the cross. Living a life of righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees is a requirement of being a follower of Jesus. But it's also, friends, a gift of grace. We cannot do it without God's spirit, God's leading, God's directing, God's correcting. It is a response to God's amazing grace in our lives when we know God's mercy, when we know God's love. We want to live for God, God's upside-down way of living, not our way, laying our life of pride, selfishness, and fear down, picking up our cross and following Jesus. What Jesus teaches on the Sermon of the Mount is actually how he lived his life. These words are his actions. This is the man who could and did live in righteousness, sharing what that means to all who have ears to hear and eyes to see. What a contrast to other lawmakers then and now, who love to make rules, but then fail to live according to their own rules. The sad truth was and is that many of us cannot get past what we know, what we think we know, what we are so sure God demands through his, these religious laws. And they keep us from seeing Jesus. Have you ever not been able to get beyond what you thought you knew about God's demands through the religious laws? Any of you? Is it just me? There have been several that have tripped me up along the way. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It's not just one of the hundreds, it's one of the mighty ten. But the Sabbath is Saturday. We worship on Sunday. I admit this didn't trip me up for long, but I am a rule follower. And it says Sabbath. 
Does God really care what day we come to corporate worship? I don't think so. The spirit of the law says we are to worship God always. How about this one? Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. <laughs> well, <laughs> this one tripped me up a little longer. I struggled with this one. I thought I would get my master's in Christian education instead of my master's of divinity. When I finally entered the process and I had to go through a psychological evaluation, I had to ask for people who knew me well to fill out a form and answer these questions about me. I had just moved here from Alabama. I asked some of my closest friends, even mentors in the faith from Alabama, to do this for me, two of them would not because they didn't believe that women should be in the pulpit. But God, God continued to lead and I reluctantly followed. It's funny, I never struggled with divorce because of my life experience with my parents. Though you could pluck out different verses about divorce and say it was against God's law. Just as you could the Sabbath or women speaking in church. My mom was beaten by my dad and her parents didn't want her to leave him. Even in my adolescent mind, I knew this was crazy. God would never want someone to stay in such a situation. Then there is homosexuality. I struggled the most and the longest with this one. I was sure what God's law was on this, and I was clear. Before I became a Presbyterian, I had to know what that denomination's stance was on this. That was in 2004. And for the next seven years, I would struggle with what I believed. Sorry, I'm looking out at some of you, and it's hitting my heart. I witnessed the Pharisees of today condemning and dehumanizing people they did not even know. On the floor of Presbytery. And they were full of hate. Hate. There was no love. When I left St. Andrews and was having doubts about what I thought I knew, I began to pray to God. And I said, God, if I am wrong about what I think, please show me. For years I had dug my heels in knowing I was right. I never asked God whether or not I was. <clears throat> Finally, I did. Just a little rabbit trail here. In Bible study, we've talked about sin and what is in the middle of sin, S-I-N. It's a great big fat I. What is in the middle of pride, P-R-I-D-E, a great big fat I. I had to let go and let God show me 
I had to make room for God's spirit. I had to give God room to turn things upside down or right side up. What happened after I started praying that prayer? I landed here. Where there are several individuals who are gay, where there are many more of you who have loved ones who are gay. I listened to your stories. I started digging into what we've come to call the clobber passages in the Bible that supposedly condemn homosexuality so I could get a better understanding of what they were really about, what was the historical setting, what was the theological context. Guess what, friends? None of those passages are about two people living in a loving, committed relationship. None. And by the time I went to General Assembly in 2014, in which they were voting on the ordination of people who were gay and on the definition of marriage, I found myself coming to a new understanding and thanks be to God, I witnessed something different on the floor of General Assembly. A conversation. An openness. And a spirit of love. When my sister in Christ, whom I love, and who is gay, was elected as an elder of this congregation, I fully, fully supported her. And while I was saddened by the members that left with her election, I will share with you what I shared with the session this past December. We are being the salt of the earth. We are being the light of the world with that decision. We are living love. We are a city on a hill. And I am proud of our church and want our community to taste and see we are an, in an inclusive, loving community. Strictly adhering to the letter of the law without taking into consideration the context in which it was written, without taking into consideration the movement of God's Spirit, without taking into consideration how Jesus interpreted the law, and without taking into consideration how Jesus lived his life. If all we had to do was keep the letter of the law, Jesus didn't need to come. He didn't need to be born as a self, as a child that couldn't take care of itself. What's the word? <laughs> oh. He didn't need to hang on the cross. But he did. What are the stumbling blocks today that prevent you from hearing this teaching, letting it live in your heart, transforming your life to live like Jesus? How can we, church, Encourage others to live the way Jesus lived without that slipping into 
judgmental attitudes on the one hand, right? We can be right all over again. But also we don't want just to have that laissez-faire accommodation. How are we the church? Jesus invites his followers to grow, to mature, to truly live, to love. Jesus calls us to follow, to act, to follow his spirit, to be the salt and the light that we may show others his way. So be salty. Be illuminating. Let us pray. Lord, we long for a world that knows peace. For too long we have fought against each other, threatened each other, conspired to grab more land, more wealth. We've lived with the wrong belief that our different nationalities and religious associations mean that we cannot live together in a spirit of acceptance and trust. Lord, we long for a world that knows justice. For too long we have tolerated the fact that some have more food than others. Some live in societies where children have all they need, while in some other places children are made to work in order that their families can eat. For too long we have tolerated the fact that some have easy access to medicine while others are denied it. Lord, we long for a world of tolerance. For too long we have been slow to accept that the differences between us are not reasons to be weary or fearful, but instead should lead us to be ready to marvel at the way creation allows each one of us to be unique and that your personal relationship with each of us encourages us to be ourselves. God, we thank you for providing us with the best teacher possible. His words and the lessons he has given us stand the test of time. And they apply now as much as they did in the past. Help us to continue to hear these teachings as they were meant to be heard. Help us understand what we can do to make sure that more and more people are able to describe their life as blessed. Help us towards a position where we cherish the blessings we already have rather than craving the ones we do not yet possess. Lord, help us to be your people, the salt of the earth and the light of the world.